Hi, welcome to Anesthesia Coffee Break, and this is part two of our interview with the Exeter of Examiners, Emma Giles. So stay tuned for lots of handy tips and tricks and all that important information about the primary exam. Actually, this, this comes to, I think we've talked a bit about now SAQs, MCUs and the whole process. An interesting point you mentioned just when we had a chat previously was it's harder to become an examiner than it is to pass the exam. So the failure rate is higher. That, that was a that was a quite an interesting point. Because they're not they're not doing an, they're not doing an exam, but there is a benchmark and there's a lot of people applying. Is, is that yeah so so there is a, a benchmark and whilst we train examiners, we really want them to come in with some qualities mm -hmm. and some past experience. Mm -hmm. So past experience of teaching, and it doesn't have to be extensive, but some familiarisation with some of the material and mm -hmm. an understanding of how trainees interact with that material. And the other quality we really need is, what we really desire, is people who aren't mean and judgmental. Mm -hmm. So that that is a really important consideration <laughs> for us. That's that's nice. That's nice. <laughs> well, I, I think that's come through. I mean, you look at the evolution of the examiner's reports and how um, the phrasing has changed so much from ten years before, where you know they would say candidates fail repeatedly to um, answer this question, or or candidates should spend more time studying this versus now in terms of actually saying that uh, good candidates would have structured this question in, in this manner. Um, would you say and, that it sounded less like a disappointed parent? And <laughs> more and more like a... Well, uh, funny you say that, Lark, because I, I, I could, I could uh, absolutely, you know, when I, when I was reading the exams report, I could actually uh, relate to those, to those uh, feedback. It's just like my parents telling me all over again, that's not, not good enough, yet. not good enough. And, and now it's, <laughs> and now it's, uh, you know, when I look at the answers, like, oh, actually, it's, this is how I do my parenting, actually, very uh, <laughs> encouraging and constructive. Uh, and, and actually, I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask you on that, uh, Emma, is, you know, with the way the examiners uh, give their, give their feedback, is there, I've noticed that some examiners would um, give feedback in terms of saying that this would be a really good structure to use to get all the answer out versus some examiners saying that these would be the key concepts to get a pass and the these would be the other concepts which would get an additional mark or a good pass. Is there instructions on which way um, is, is preferred? We, at, um, no, so the examiners are giving relatively free reign about what they can write. And if they want, they can write that they're disappointed. And then the chair of the exam will take that sentence out. Now, Emma, is there any chance of the examiners, instead of writing feedback, just writing a model answer? That'd be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, no, because we're planning on reusing some of the questions. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Um, we might move on to some of the questions some of um, Stan, Stan's trainees actually put in. Um, what's the best advice that you would give to a trainee sitting their primary exam in March? I think that by this stage, the informative assessment, if it hasn't already been a big part of your study, should be becoming a far more important part of your study. And by formative assessment, I mean testing yourself and having other people test you. Yep. And, and that's, I think, what we tell all our trainees, start exam practice from even day one, because it's, you, you know, you've got to learn how to play the game as well as consume the knowledge and be, be able to uh, reproduce it. And also, by the time you get to, um, get to this point and you're sitting in March, the material is very familiar to you. Mm. And you need to be tested to find out whether that's familiarity, just recognition or familiarity actually knowing the material. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, you're just going to potentially skate over material that you're just simply recognising. You don't actually know mm. and understand properly. Yeah, okay. No, that's good. The, the, the biggest tip, do exam focus practice from now to the exam, straight from the X chair. <laughs> Keeping in mind, though, that as an examiner, 
we only see what is the finished product on the page or, or speaking to us. And so we don't actually know the journey that's taken the trainee there. Yeah. So often asking an examiner for advice on preparation for the exam, and this we do a lot of preparation of our own trainees, we're actually not a great person to ask because we can talk a bit about having white space on your paper, for example, but we can't talk very well about yeah. how to how to study for the exam. Different skill set. Yeah, and one of the other questions that from our trainees was, uh, what do you think are the top three qualities or learnt behaviours um, that uh, create a successful candidate? Yeah, so I had to think about that one because... Um, yeah, since you sent it to me. And the first one is, in fact, I came up with two really easy ones that just sprang to mind, and there are probably others. Mm. But the first one is curiosity. Mm. Be curious. Be curious about how things work. Being curious. Uh, I mean, that generally helps you in your in your career, being curious about, about your patients, being curious about your colleagues and that way being supportive of them. Mm. But the curious candidates who want to know how things work in theatre mm-hmm. and how the patient's bodies work mm-hmm. and how the drugs work. That is just such, such a great um, mm. behaviour to have and, and attribute. And the other one is determination. This is a really, really hard job to study for this exam. Mm. You've got to stick to it for a long, long period of time. So that mm. grit and determination and not being distracted. And every trainee has their own level of burdens they have to deal with outside the exam. Mm. You know, some, some may have children, some may have sick family, some, um, mm. some may, you know, may not have those kind of levels, but even the, the problems that come up in their own personal life still are very, very disruptive. So having being determined and having ways of dealing with those other issues so you can keep focusing on the exam. Absolutely. I think that's, again, one a really good point. I really like the idea of curiosity, uh, Emma. And, you know, it's something that I have never heard of before, but it makes so much sense. And it's such a positive way to frame the idea that, you know, when we're in theatre, we want to ask questions, we want to communicate, we want to collaborate, we want to be creative. And I think curiosity just encapsulates all those qualities really, really nicely. Mm. Um, and I think it's something that trainees can start right from day one. And I, and I know that a lot of trainees now are incredibly stressed and worried as they come up to the March exam because they feel they don't have 100% knowledge of everything that's there. But that's okay. I think, you know, you can still go into theater and you can still have that frame of mind that you still want to know about, you know, what's, what's this drug I'm using, you know, and, and let's, let's go through the process about being curious about finding out what's the time to onset, what's the time to offset. And I think it, you, you phrased it just with that one word. So, so well. And, and really it's, it's, it's like being a child again. You know, remember that friend you had, who just kept asking why, and it got, it got a bit annoying. I think you almost have to be that in your own mind. Why, 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 why? <laughs> um, maybe the, the next question uh, it may be a bit difficult to answer uh, on, on a podcast, but you might have some things that address it. Can you give, give examples of a two out of five short answer question versus a three out of five short answer question? Yeah, so that is really difficult to answer um, just by talking. So I think it was in 2019 we put an appendix on the SAQ paper with an example of a two out of five and a three out of five and a little bit about the history of the SAQ and, and how it's marked. So mainly, I guess I would refer people to that. What I could say now would be that with a, so those lower cognitive, low questions, which are predominantly factual, then a two out of five is just not many facts, but, but, but there's some facts there. Whereas a three out of five becomes either a lot more facts or even in the absence of that, demonstrating an understanding of the facts that you've written and also be able to tie them together and say, this relates to that or this leads to that. In the more um, higher cognitive low questions, 
I guess it's more, it's a lot more of that demonstrating that understanding the two out of five is here are some facts and three out of five is not being curious about them. So it, it is difficult to just talk generally, but I'd say there will be the points. But if people have a look at that um, appendix in 2019, uh, I think that's uh, that's a really good summary, especially just just you know through through voice on a podcast, and we'll definitely be able to put a link to that document as well. Um, yeah, Stan, you, you go for it. Yeah, I was just going to make a comment on that two out of five and three out of five mark, and I think that um, it, it, as it sort of came across that question, I, I think trainees are approaching it the the you know the wrong way in terms of. Yeah, and I think and see so you sort of nodding your head. Um, in in terms of you know doing it as a numbers game, whereas I I think that the way that trainees should approach these um, questions, it's about trying to get you know the answer the question, get the key concepts across, and it it's not just about listing concepts down because that's not what what it is. It you actually need to show and tie it into the question that's being asked. Because a lot of times I'll hear trainees say that I've got, I've ha I had the right concept and why wasn't I given a mark for that? And it's often because it actually hasn't um, been tied, tied back to the question. So I think that, uh, you know, the, the focus should really be about, you know, showing that you actually understand the question rather than trying to list concepts in order to, to get, um, you know, to, to gain like a, a binary number. Mm. Yeah, there are probably some situations where knowing how things are marked helps you in answering, whereas in this, you write the best answer you can. Yeah. And I don't think that there is a, a gaming that you can do other than being aware that exactly what you were saying, that you don't want to just list material, you want to demonstrate understanding. Mm. And as you were saying before as well, a great way of demonstrating that understanding is really highlighting what are key points and not writing in prose, but then commenting on those key points. Yeah. Now, um, Emma, can you sort of comment on how, you know, with your journey through this um, being, an, being an examiner, how that sort of changed over over the time? And how, how long have you been an examiner for? Um, 13 years. 13 years. Okay. Well, this is this question is perfect then. So um, how, is, how, is you, how have you seen the shift in exam focus change over the, the last decade? And what do you think are some of the future developments uh, in store for this exam? Sure. So when I first started as an examiner, I think we were still at that, we were just slowly coming out of that collegiate, we're a bunch of subject matter experts, and that's what matters, not education theory. Okay. And over the time I've been involved with the exam, there's been a real realization it's not just subject matter expertise, which is important. You really have to understand more about education and testing theory, which hopefully has been coming out as I've been talking today. Yeah. Where are the exam is going in the future? I don't know. The, Certainly the pandemic has forced us in many ways to just think about the present. So whilst there might have been changes in the delivery of the exam, the exam conceptually has in many ways frozen because it is really very demanding of our resources to just simply run the exam with the difficulties we have at the moment. So the only future moving forward that's happening at the moment is the actual delivery of the BIVA examination. Mm. Otherwise, it's very difficult. You know, it's, and it's now out of my hands. I, I spent my, my <laughs> two years, which were involved, um, I suppose my time as deputy as well, being involved in, in directing the exam. But now I'm just an examiner. You know, that, that's not my responsibility and other people have taken up the reins. And so I think that was the, probably leads well to the next question, which is, um, do you think the exam could go completely online in the near future, um, especially realising the current environment? Sure. So I guess there we have the conceptual um, 
Are you thinking there about the written components or the bio components? So, yeah, I, I think that the question has been for both because yeah. um, a lot of times when I get trainees to do practice answers, they do it on their iPad. And, and I do tell them that look, car, in its current form, it is, it is pen to paper, um, but that may change in the future. Sure. So the, the, that type of decision is actually outside the remit of the, the primary exam subcommittee because it's a major college decision that would impact on all exams and require significant financial investment in the required software. So I, I just can't answer that at all. It's just not in the area I work. With the Viva examinations, we're quite happy with uh, um, the level of fidelity that we get with the, the Viva examinations because we, since we have both the screens seeing each other like we do now, but imagine that we've added to it a shared tablet. And so I would have a tablet on my desk, I would write things and you would see it, you could then annotate the tablet. And so we can do a diagram drawing. So that actually works quite nicely. Yeah. There is still, I think, a role for face-to-face. -face, and I don't know whether that I'm, I don't know whether I'm biased here because this is the way I'm familiar with it. Yeah. Um, but I just feel that we can um, help the candidates who are struggling a little bit more if we're face to face. Mm -hmm. There is nothing more satisfying as an examiner than having someone coming in, shaking and terrified, and then having them wax eloquent to us because they've relaxed. <laughs> and I just, and I, because we don't want to know what they can tell us when they're terrified. We, we want to know what they know and understand when, when they're relaxed. Mm -hmm. and I just feel that we can't achieve that. Mm -hmm. on a video conferencing software. Mm -hmm. so I think there are some candidates who we can help more face-to-face. -face. That, that so, is so heartening to, to know, Emma, to know that um, you are on their side. It, it's just so heartwarming to know that, you know, a trainee who comes in looking terrified and the examiner on the other side recognizes that and actually wants to help them and actually wants to make them feel comfortable so that they can actually show off what they know. Uh, yeah. I think a lot of times um, trainees, when they come in, they, they, it, they almost come in like, like it's, it's um, adversarial or you know, they, they, it's almost like a bit of a competition between yourself and the examiner, which is not the case at all. It, it sounds like this, you know, like the, the, new, the new generation of examiners, they want to help you. They want to... I, I, just had this, I just had this image of like, you could either think of the examiners as guards at a gate with spears and, you know, shields and everything, or there's like, they're, they're like your exam coaches and they're coaching you through the, you know, getting you past, getting, getting you across the line. It's a far more nice, pleasant way of, you know, imagining it. And I think what you've said really attests to that. Yeah. Um, and, and quickly, Emma, do you know, you've also, you've also been through the split between the physiology and pharmacology where there was um, papers where they were set separately and now they're combined. Um, what what are your thoughts on the on that shift over the last uh, eight, seven to eight years? I think 2014 it got split. Sure. So if we go back even further in time, there was a there was a physiology and a pharmacology paper, but you had to pass both of them at the same set. And so there were candidates who would come, they would pass pharmacology and face food and fail physiology, but they would fail overall, so they would have to come back again and then reset pharmacology. And Neville Gibbs, who was the chair at the time, just felt that was really unfair. And so he was the one who actually split the exam. And the whole purpose of that was to allow candidates to, to come in, sit both, but if they fail one component, well, that was fine, fine. They could hold the other one and just concentrate on the one they failed. Unfortunately, though, it then started being used in a different way. And so candidates would choose to just sit one component and then come back and sit the other component. And that was never the purpose. It really dragged out the time that they were studying. And really, they increased the amount of work they had to put in. It's not it's not purely summative if you just do one and then just do the other, the amount of work you do. 
we are also and um, and we're also starting to realise as examiners that sometimes we would have to abruptly stop our questioning that was going down a particular path because we were about to jump disciplines. Mm -hmm. And really in practice, it's all integrated. So it was brought back in as an integrated exam. And certainly I'm very, having seen and worked in both, I prefer, I think that the integrated way is much better because I think it helps the candidates to study in a more, study in a better way that they see all the material holistically instead of, or instead of artificially separating it for one exam or the other. Well, I think you're right. There's a lot of symmetry between yeah. the physiology and pharmacology. And I remember during my Viva in 2008, um, in my pharmacology exam, I got asked about oxygen. And then uh, this is in pharmacology. And then it sort of let down to almost like the physiological, um, you know, consequences of oxygen. And I think the you're right. You're absolutely right. The examiner went, oh, this is too much physiology here. Let's um, head back to pharmacology. So, so I think, yeah, I think the, the combined... Uh, the combined way of teaching it and also examining it uh, really works and really helps with learning. And I think that that's what the goal of the college is, is to really help this um, process become easier, not harder. Mm. And uh, Emma, um, what is your favourite topic to ask Candid on a day? Do you have like a favourite that you just enjoy talking about? Um, I do have some favourite topics, but that doesn't mean I can talk about them. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we're, we're we're trying to jump. We're trying to jump the gun here. Yeah, we're trying so, to give give a little tips. <laughs> yeah. So intent. The exam. <laughs> so once the SAQ has been um, been written, and then we then look at the vivas. The vivas then have to match that SAQ. So so we can't re ask. Um, material that's been asked on the SAQ. So the two get mapped together. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes people ask us about why can't we hold the SAQ and then sit a viva in another sit. And that is problematic in that you will then be sitting a set of vivas that are mapped to a different SAQ paper, not mm -hmm. the SAQ paper you sat. Yeah. Now each candidate is going to um, see six examiners and we could potentially all ask the same thing mm. so we have to decide beforehand as to what is going to be asked so we do have relatively free reign on what we want to ask but it all has to fit in what with what every other examiner is asking that group both to make sure that there's no overlap and also to make sure that there is a reasonable body of coverage as well. Yeah. So in the weeks leading up to the exam, we will nominate what we would like to talk about. The more junior examiners put down what they want to talk about first, and then the more senior examiners will work around that. And then... Uh, the five are captains in each group of six is a captain who will then go through each five with a fine tooth comb to see mm -hmm. that they meet that criteria. And then just to make sure we haven't missed anything the day before the exams actually start, we will all sit down in, per in person or using video conferencing software mm -hmm. and actually um, talk through what we're going to ask mm -hmm. to make sure it fits all of those criteria. Emma, thanks, thanks so much. I mean, just just having this chat over the last you know, sixty minutes or so, it's it's just been so so great to see. Like, it's such a rigorous process, and you know, I thought studying for the exam was hard, which absolutely was. But you know, it sounds like you guys are kind of going through some level of this every you know twice a year, just to make this exam fair and rigorous and a, and a good assessment uh, to try and make better an to this. So it's it's it's, I don't know, it's really it feels like a really great chat we had because that's, that's really enlightened me to a lot of these things. Um, um, that's, that's probably all we have time to chat. I'm sure we can talk for hours about this. Um, and we might get you on another time for, for the, uh, more well, the, the hard hitting questions maybe, or the, uh, <laughs> I think we have to absolutely. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, thank you. Did, did you have any else, uh, anything else you w- would like to add um, before we sign off? No, only thanks so much for having me along. I, you know, we really want to get this kind of information out there. It's not secret, mm-hmm. but we just worry that candidates that don't have mm-hmm. exposure to examiners just don't hear this and have concerns about the exam, but hopefully we can, we can allay for them. Amazing. No, that's definitely, that, that's great. And I think as our reach grows, I think, um, yeah, these, these are just all the different platforms that everyone, everyone uses these days, which is all, which was new to us a couple, until a couple <laughs> of years ago when we started. So yeah, well, thanks very, very, very much for your time. I really, really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for listening and listening to Anesthesia Copy Blake. Please share with anyone who might be interested and who's sitting this exam and wants to get through it first time and uh, get through it well and thrive for the rest of their career. So thanks very much for listening and see you next time. Thank you.